So thank you very much, uh, Nora, for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, however, I would caution you against telling a Greek lawyer uh, that you will be flexible uh, with uh, the rules. We tend to take advantage of it on both sides <laughs> of uh, that uh, description. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us so uh, early in the morning. Uh, I have to apologize. I haven't had my cup of coffee. Uh, so I'm still uh, running uh, based on the alcohol intake of, of yesterday, so my arguments might not make that much sense. Uh, but I'll try to uh, make a, a reasonable uh, narrative. Um, so uh, I tweaked the title a little bit. I, I kept my original one, uh, The Viability and Need for Interpretation of Customer International Law, or Why is Interpretation of Customer International Law Inevitable? Uh, just to make it a little bit more uh, provocative. So, uh, before I start, and this, uh, these uh, ideas uh, came to me more and more while we were discussing yesterday about this whole debate about uh, the two-element uh, approach, or whether it's a two-element or one-element, what exactly it is, at a particular time, and I kept, uh, the image of the Mobius strip kept coming back to me again and again, uh, this whole idea of having a, a two-sided uh, object, and then with simply changing the dimensional uh, aspects, turning it a little bit, essentially ending uh, with an object that only has one uh, surface. Now, I don't know what this actually means uh, for customer international law, I'm just throwing it out there. Uh, we can further discuss it at, at another point. Uh, but uh, these issues of what exactly the, the formation of customer international law is, is not what I'm going to be dealing with. So what I'm going to be dealing with is the interpretation of customer international law. So the whole idea of the Tricky Law uh, project uh, was essentially to address uh, the question uh, of whether we can have something, whether there is a process uh, other than uh, what we know as state practice in the new years that leads to the formation of customer international law. So, oh, sorry, I've got to change the slide. Yeah, so the, the image I was talking about was this, the Mobius strip. Uh, and the uh, image is basically that this is the, the classical approach to state practice within the US leading to the formation of classroom international. Um, and one of the questions that we had was that once the uh, state practice within the US collapsed uh, into a uh, customer international law rule, uh, irrespective of whether this is done in a single particular instant or whether this is a little bit more fu fuzzy, kind of like a Sorites uh, argument. The question is, once it has been established, can we really repeat the same sequence every time or should we uh, basically uh, approach it in a different way, the way we approach, uh, similar to the way we approach uh, treaty rules? So this is what we suggest, uh, basically. Uh, I might have to, uh, after the presentation by uh, this panel, and uh, Orfea specifically, who is going to be talking about state practice, I might have to tweak it a little bit, because in the, in the first stage I said not interpretation. I might have to amend it to say <laughs> not interpretation in the way <laughs> that we mean it for the next stage. It might be a different kind of interpretation. But basically the idea is that once we have the rule, the question is, can we uh, identify possible rules? And as I said, we use rules in a very, very uh, broad sense uh, uh, that guide the interpretation of customary international law uh, when we try to apply it in each case. So the idea is whether the content determination is not something that happens only at the stage of formation, but continues to happen uh, at every uh, stage uh, after this. So, is interpretation restricted to written sources? This is the main uh, thing, uh, the main counter argument to the possibility of interpretation of customer international law. Now, the main arguments uh, can be combined into three main groups. The first group is it is because it is. Uh, of course, this is an axiomatic statement, so I can very easily devolve into a childish game. Yes, it is, no, it isn't, yes, it is, no, it isn't. Um, so this has nothing uh, to, uh, to do uh, more with this. If we take it as an axiomatic statement, uh, then I can equally make another axiomatic statement saying no, it isn't. Uh, and actually, I think that based on the evidence that we have, it can prove that this is not a true axiom, that this is more a pseudo uh, axiom. Uh, now, a lot of the times uh, when we uh, look in, in the writings, uh, most of the times, uh, the, the argument is that uh, content merges with existence. Uh, 
uh, with respect to Customer International. This is uh, taken, if I remember correctly, from Martin Voss uh, and the methodology of international law. Uh, other authors like uh, Tulio Treves, for instance, in uh, one of his uh, submissions, I think for the Max Planck Encyclopedia, simply has one sentence saying, uh, only written rules can be interpreted, but no analysis uh, further on. So th that is one main problem, that there is uh, no analysis. On the other hand, you can find several authors that use the word interpretation all the time when they talk about uh, customer international law, but at least for us, uh, this was not sufficient. You could possibly argue that you're using interpretation in a very uh, ordinary way, or you use interpretation not in the sense of a legal interpretation, and so on. So the next possible group is that due to the vagueness or due to the nature of customer international law, interpretation is <coughs> impossible. So this is another argument that uh, because of its unwritten nature, uh, we cannot interpret uh, customer international law. Now, I don't find this argument very uh, convincing uh, in the sense uh, that, uh, again, it flirts very, uh, very much with uh, it being axiomatic. But also, I think it kind of shoots itself in the foot, uh, because the, the whole idea of interpretation is essentially to uh, collapse uh, the, uh, the content in a particular case, to give it a particular uh, meaning. Uh, as Hart would say, that every, every rule has a sexual core of application, but a penumbra of uncertainty, and this, uh, the, the process of interpretation is aim to do exactly that, to clarify this penumbra of uncertainty. Uh, so by saying that customer international law is by its nature vague and uncertain, I would argue that this makes it even a stronger case that interpretation should be allowed for a customary uh, international uh, law. And then the final argument is that no international court has ever done so. Um, and I think this is uh, the one uh, that I'm going to spend uh, most of the time giving a few examples. And I have to be very careful because uh, some of these examples are going to be used also by uh, my uh, wonderful PhD researchers. Uh, so trying to be very brief, we can talk more about. Uh, the aim here is to simply show that this is by no means uh, true uh, at all. So. Uh, one thing that I would like to, to stress before, before I begin about the, uh, the uh, examples of interpretation of, of customer international law is um, the, uh, why then uh, do we have this problem? Why don't we have a wide discussion about uh, interpretation of customer international law? And I'm, I'm very way, way off uh, from uh, law here. Uh, this is my other passion, chess. Uh, so this is a classical, uh, in psychology, this is known as the Einstein effect. Uh, so uh, basically that uh, individuals uh, get very quickly trained to think in a particular pattern. Our pattern recognition uh, is very easily programmed. So there's a fantastic, uh, which I, I tend to make my students suffer from it, a fantastic psychological experiment which is called the Luchens Luchens. Uh, water jug experiment where you give them uh, water jugs uh, with different quantities and you tell them make this particular quantity and they have Ten spoilers, by the way. Uh, they have ten examples, and the uh, the aim of the uh, experiment is to show that within three examples, everybody gets trained to think in a particular pattern: doubling, subtracting, and we're done. And in some cases, this does not work. So uh, people will start saying, "No, this is not possible. There is no solution." Whereas the solution might be a simple subtraction. Um, and this was done also with, uh, with chess players where they tracked their eye movement, they gave them one particular uh, uh, position and tried to, to uh, ask them what is the correct move here. Uh, and uh, you saw them focusing a lot on one particular area which was not the right solution and it took them a lot of time to break free. So my argument here, uh, which has nothing to do with, uh, with law, is that basically we get trained in a particular motif of thinking and then it is sometimes very difficult to break free from it. So that might be one of the reasons. So let's start with actual proof. Even at the ICC statute, if we look at Article 21, it says the court may apply principles and rules of law as interpreted in its previous decisions. So both principles and rules, it doesn't say whether it's treaty rules or customary rules, but it says that they may be interpreted. The same thing in paragraph 3. Uh, 
the application and interpretation of law pursuant to this article, again, no distinction between treaty rules or uh, customary rules. Now you might say, okay, well, uh, they're not very uh, explicit, uh, but if we'll we, and I'll uh, revert back to, sorry, to Marcus Beham's uh, presentation uh, yesterday about the Utrecht Magis Ballet and how you need to interpret treaty, I would say that this makes a, a nice argument that you can interpret customary international law. Um, but let's go uh, actually to the ICJ and the PCIJ statutes. Uh, oh, sorry. So Article 36, the jurisdiction of the court in all legal disputes concerning the interpretation of the treaty and any question of international law. Now there you can make an argument, oh, you see there is a difference, uh, a linguistic difference, because you cannot interpret customary international law. That's not entirely accurate, because if you go to the preparatory uh, works, uh, there was an amendment proposed by uh, Ritchie Buzzati, uh, I apologize to all the Italians here if I mispronounce it, where it was actually, the, the second version was the interpretation or application of a general rule of international law. There was a long discussion about whether they should adopt this. Everybody agreed it was the correct version. The only reason that they opted for the first version was because this was linguistic usage. This was a term that was used in the Covenant of the League of Nations that they said we need to retain continuity. Okay. You might say, oh, but these are statutes, we don't care that much about. Let's go to actual case law. In the Nicaragua case, you have a paragraph that says, rules which are identical in treaty law and in customary international law are also distinguishable by reference to the methods of interpretation and application. Now, you could read it both ways. You could uh, say that this means that they have different methods of interpretation, or you could say, oh, no, what they mean is actually that treaty rules uh, are... Uh, Interpreted, whereas customary rules are uh, not. So, well, if that is the, uh, the the second one is the correct understanding, uh, this paragraph should have been somewhat redrafted because linguistically it's not entirely accurate. Uh, but let's go to the North Sea Continental Shelf case, if you're not persuaded, where Judge Tanaka, in his uh, dissenting opinion, explicitly said the method of logical and teleological interpretation can be applied in the case of customary law as in the case of written law. Now, I always tell my students uh, every sentence is open to interpretation, but this to me seems pretty uh, cut and dry is the expression, something like that. Um, now, here is a very indicative list of other cases. Uh, the Gulf of Maine case that also Marcus uh, mentioned yesterday, the North Sea Continental Shelf case. And the reason why I like the North Sea Continental Shelf case is because it's usually used a lot of the times to discuss uh, customary international law and the two element uh, approach. And you can find, even in the main judgment, references to the words interpretation of customary law, interpretation of rules. Now, uh, briefly, I'll go and show you that this is. Uh, not just for old cases, but even for newer ones. And the Delalage case, you have uh, through a reasonable as well as purposive interpretation of the existing provisions of international customary law. So we're talking about purposive inter uh, interpretation here. Uh, that principle does not prevent a court from determining an issue through a process of interpretation and clarification as to the elements of a particular crime, and that particular case that we're talking also about the customary rule. Uh, but my <coughs> Personal favorite, and this I need to give credit to my uh, PhD, uh, Ms. Marina Fortuna, for this one. Uh, Judge Shahabuddin in the Khatikasanovich case basically says if state practice and opinion jurists have thrown up a relevant principle of customary international law, I won't go into the, uh, the mixing of principle and customary law, uh, the solution turns on the principle. But that does not bar all forward movement, and principle may need to be interpreted before it is applied. In the process of clarification, the tribunal has the competence to interpret an established principle of law and to consider whether, as so interpreted, the principle applies to the particular situation before it. So there are some repeated patterns. There are, there are many more cases, but these were just simply some of the cases where uh, the, the judges and in the main uh, case uh, the reference to interpretation uh, is referred to. Uh, and again, these repeated patterns are not entirely uh, Yes. Uh, 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 this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, 
so we have logical interpretation, and this is interesting because it harks back to Fiore's draft story when they were trying to uh, draft the, the law of treaties, uh, and they were suggesting logical uh, rules of interpretation, teleological interpretation, systemic interpretation, and teleological interpretation, lato sensor, where they actually refer to the object and purpose, not of the rule, but actually of the entire body of rules of that particular system. Now, in this last minute, uh, and uh, I'll use this last minute actually to uh, refer back to your misinterpretation of, of customer international law. Now, why do we need uh, rules of uh, interpretation? Because if we don't have this discussion, if we don't clarify this, as happened also with rules of interpretation with respect to treaties, there is no accepted language in which they can use and no particular method of, of, of thinking. Um, and this is evident, I think, with uh, the EC Biotech uh, case. Uh, which I love to, uh, to use it as an example uh, because it shows all the problems. So there you had a case uh, where the, the panel, the WTO, which by the way is not allowed to apply uh, the VCLT, they had to apply the customary law rules on interpretation, uh, went into a whole discourse about what do we mean by Article 31.3c. Article 31.3c basically t it says that in the process of interpretation, you take into account any relevant rules, uh, applicable between uh, the parties. And the question was, how do you understand parties? Parties to the dispute, parties to the treaty. Now, what they did was, and I cut it down uh, to, to, to a very short point. First of all, they kept saying, reinterpret, reinterpret. Uh, although they said reinterpret Article 31, 3C, they were not allowed, to, they, they, they shouldn't be doing that because uh, essentially they had to apply uh, the, uh, the customary law. And the parties, by the way, were the United States, not a party. CLT, the EU, international organization, not a party uh, to uh, the VCLT. Uh, and then they came to the conclusion that uh, we need to understand it as parties to the treaty. So very uh, restricted interpretation and therefore the rule was not relevant. But if you break it down, what they were actually doing was they were taking the customary rule on interpretation in order to understand it they interpreted it systemically, so they used a relevant rule, they used the VCLT, the codification, let's say, treaty, um, and they came to a conclusion that said parties to, the, uh, parties to the treaty, but they used a treaty to which none of the parties to the dispute were. So uh, I'm not sure you understand, the, the, the essentially came to a conclusion X by using a method that is completely the opposite. They took a very restrictive <coughs> interpretation of the rule, but the way they applied it was actually completely the opposite. They used a rule that none of the parties, not to the treaty, none of the parties to the dispute was a party to. So uh, I'll conclude, I'll stop here. Uh, I've abused uh, too much your, uh, your kindness, uh, Nora. Uh, so uh, these are just a few examples in order to uh, demonstrate that uh, uh, what the project is about, to uh, think that once the rule has been established, to examine whether there are some rules, principles, maxims <coughs> that govern its interpretation in order to determine its content further. Thank you very much. Ah, I'd like to thank the ERC as well uh, for uh, funding and uh, thank you very much for your attention.